January 11th, 1965, Archie Moore, the old mongoose, was now at the end of his long career in the ring. But the well-spoken Moore was just as popular and well-respected as he had been over the past few decades. He was taken on a busy schedule and was now acting as an ambassador in the sport of boxing. He was getting acting roles, refereeing, managing fighters, running the restaurant and turning down state commission jobs. The old school fighters such as Jack Dempsey and Jess Willard respected the old mongoose. Basically his opinion was valued from the fight fans as well as the boxing media and fighters. Archie Moore was now a writer for 14 different newspapers as well. As a media man, Moore seemed somewhat obsessed with the heavyweight division and what was going on with Ali and Liston. According to Moore, Muhammad Ali would have lost the rematch against Liston if the original November 1964 date had held up. Moore said that Liston was in the best shape of his life and underestimated Ali in the first fight. But after the fight was canceled, Liston went back to the streets. He picked up a few new charges and was no longer motivated to train as hard as he did in the fall of the previous year. Moore told the media that Liston was not focused and had doubt Liston was in training. The only time Liston surfaced was to support his buddy Cleveland Williams, who had just been shot by law enforcement, followed by picking up several charges, not to mention Liston's age. Moore, like many of the other fighters, felt Liston was in his early 40s and should be spending his last years in boxing training. It was Moore that had an inside scoop on the fighters and kept it real about Liston's bad habits. On January the 11th, the writers continued to release negative articles on the current crop of heavyweights. Liston had been seen around recently coming and going to and from the hospital where Cleveland Williams was kept. The media men following Liston said that Liston appeared to be overweight. Liston would visit Williams and was constantly leaving to go pick up food and seemed to care less about his upcoming fight with Ali. As of early January, Ali was still recovering and appeared to be out of shape himself. The upcoming WBA title fight scheduled between Ernie Terrell and Eddie Machen was being downplayed by boxing purists, and it appeared as though the fight fans of the mid-1960s had some doubt regarding the future of the heavyweight division. The old school fighters were also speaking out against the current heavyweights, especially Jack Dempsey, and now there was Archie Moore. Joe Lewis and Jersey Joe Walcott bit their tongues on the modern heavyweight crop. Marciano had his criticisms, but was part of Team Shivalo and spent most of his time with the media promoting George Shivalo. Jack Dempsey continued his push for federal regulation and continued to push Gene Tunney's son, who was a politician, to stay focused on bringing boxing under federal control. Dempsey also continued to tell the media that the fighters from the 1960s were soft and did not know how to fight. According to Dempsey and some of the old school diehards, boxing started going downhill as more televisions was introduced into households. There was a lot of heavyweight boxing news in the air on January the 11th. Canadian heavyweight George Chevalo and his entourage would arrive in America for his upcoming bout with Floyd Patterson on February the 1st of 1965. Chevalo seemed to already be looking past Patterson and appeared to be more interested in the Ali vs. Liston winner more so than a shot at the winner of the upcoming WBA title bout between Ernie Terrell and Eddie Machen. Chevalo wanted to fight with Liston more than anyone else and believed Liston's style was tailor-made for him. But to get a fight with Liston, Shavalo would have to beat Patterson and Liston would have to beat Ali. Shavalo was predicting a knockout victory over Patterson and told the media that Patterson does not have the chin to go the distance with him. The reason why Shavalo and other fighters were more interested in the Ali vs. Liston winner was because Ali and Liston was the two biggest earners in all of sports. They earned more than all other athletes, be it individual or team sports. On January the 12th of 1965, there was a nice card going on in the UK. It was billed as an American versus British event. England's most popular heavyweight Henry Cooper fought Buffalo, New York's Dick Whipperman. America's popular middleweight 
Ruben Hurricane Carter was supposed to be featured on this card, but his fight was canceled. The UK fight fans remained focused on their heavyweight, Henry Cooper. Cooper was actually brought in late to add some prestige to the card, as the card had lost out on featuring world-class middleweight Reuben Hurricane Carter. Cooper was at that point the British and Commonwealth heavyweight champion. Of course, those titles would not be on the line facing American fighter Dick Whipperman. Whipperman was coming off a decision loss, recently facing the power-punching Oscar Bonavina. Whipperman was actually the first fighter to ever take the undefeated Bonavita the distance. Whipperman was inked to be seven years younger than Cooper. Whipperman was also known to be a fighter that had more important things going on outside of the ring. He was the owner of a gymnasium and a part-time snowplow driver. Henry Cooper was at a crossroads and some of the fight fans thought Cooper's best days was behind him. There was also a rumor that Cooper had wanted no parts of Sonny Liston when Liston had the belts and Cooper had once told the British media that he would never fight Liston. But Cooper was also remembered as one of the fighters that had given Ali some fits and even floored him in their bout a year and a half earlier. If Cooper could stop Whipperman, this would look good to the boxing insiders considering Whipperman had just went the distance with the hard punching Oscar Bonavina. Bonavina wasn't a known fighter yet, but the magazines had already taken notice and had high expectations for Bonavina comparing the brash young fighter from Argentina to Rocky Marciano. Cooper was coming off a decision loss to American journeyman fighter Roger Risher, so he was no doubt at a crossroads and needed a big win to remain close to the top 10 boxing ratings. Most ratings had recently removed Cooper from the top 10 and Cooper was rated mostly right outside of the top 10 ratings. The fight would take place and Cooper would stop Whipperman in the fifth round. But Cooper, who was susceptible to cuts, was cut over his left eye, and it appeared as though Cooper was losing the fight. Out of desperation, Cooper came out strong in the fifth round. It was a left hand that would floor Whipperman. Whipperman got up and was floored again with another strong left hand. Now, as far as how to pronounce Whipperman, some say Whipperman, some say Whipperman. In old video footage, I heard Whipperman. But let's get back to Henry Cooper. After the fight, Cooper said that he believes he has the best left hand in the business and that he expects the left will soon place him in title contention. He said that his goal was to eventually get another fight with Ali. January 12, 1965. Ali was back in the news and once again, he was in court as a spectator to hear proceedings regarding the beating of former friend Leon Amir. Exactly what the beating had to do with had not been fully explained up to this point in 1965. There was some that attempted to assassinate the character of Amir. But there was no doubt about it, Amir had angered some of his former friends affiliated with the NOI. With Ali returning to the Boston area, Shavalo and Patterson's camps were within driving distance and the media was already gearing up for Ali to arrive at both fighters camps. Ali told the media that his plan was to fight Liston as long as Liston could stay out of jail long enough for the rematch to occur in a timely manner. Even though Liston was not at that time incarcerated, Ali told the media that Liston was in jail and that he would be too old when he is released from jail. After fighting Liston, he would then fight Shivalo, who Ali was predicting would stop Floyd Patterson. Ali said something that came as a surprise to most observers. He said that Shivalo may have what it takes to actually beat him. He said that Shivalo is who he really wants to fight. Ali said that he had been knocked down before and credited Shivalo as a big puncher, giving Shivalo a puncher's chance. He also said that a fight with Shivalo would be a bigger fight as Shivalo could be viewed as a white hope. The next day, January the 13th, Ali said that he is waiting on the okay from his physician later that day as to when he will begin light training. When asked when he would fight Liston, Ali responded by telling the media he will fight Liston when Liston gets out of jail. Right now, the big beer is in hibernation, said Ali. Ali would go to his scheduled visit with his physician and was recognized by fight fans. Let's not forget, Ali was diagnosed with hernia towards the end of the previous year. 
and he was still recovering from the hernia operation. Now, he was recognized by fight fans and a playful Ali signed autographs and promoted his upcoming fight with Liston. He was mostly telling people about the big beer and telling people that Liston is currently still in jail. The media corrected Ali by informing the readers that Liston was currently out on bail. Ali knew this but was being sarcastic. As he signed autographs, he also took time out to throw a few verbal jabs at Shavalo and Patterson, calling Shavalo the washerwoman and Patterson the rabbit. Ali was also receiving credit for promoting the upcoming fight between Shavalo and Patterson, but was not speaking on the upcoming WBA fight between Terrell and Machen. According to the news, one of Shavalo's trainers, Charlie Goldman, was now training both Shavalo and up-and-coming young heavyweight Oscar Bonavina. There was no news at the time as to if he was matching the two heavyweights up in sparring. Both was being compared to Rocky Marciano. Both was said to have difficulty finding sparring partners. Goldman did, however, hire on some assistance for training Bonavina as Irish Billy Graham was brought in to assist with Bonavina. Shavalo was accepting of any advice coming from former heavyweight champion of the world Rocky Marciano, but not the arrogant Bonavina, who was rude and had told Goldman that Rocky was a washed up old fighter. In a few more years, Bonavina and Shavalo would fight. We will cover that fight later in the documentary, but reading the build up to their fight a few years later, it appears that the two fighters may have never been matched up in sparring and maybe the additional assistance was brought in for Bonavina as Shavalo was closer to a world title shot. Also on the 13th of January, the articles continued to pour in criticizing the WBA for stripping Ali and honoring the Ring Magazine for having a more legit ranking system than the WBA. The WBA had stripped Ali of the title and removed Sonny Liston and Cleveland Williams from their rankings. The Ring Magazine acknowledged all three and still had Ali listed as their champion. In 1965, the media seemed to care less about the WBC. The WBC was not even acknowledged in the majority of the articles printed at that time. The WBC gave their support to the WBA, but was not placing their belt on the line in the upcoming Terrell vs. Machen WBA title fight. On January 14th, it was announced that Henry Cooper would have to defend his British and Commonwealth titles facing Johnny Prescott. Prescott was not a fighter that would give Cooper a big push in the world ratings, but this is who Cooper was being mandated by the board of control to fight. At least Cooper could get some revenge for his twin brother who had been stopped by Prescott. Prescott had also beat Brian London. London was another popular fighter from out of the UK. Prescott was not a bad fighter, but was coming off a loss and was not recognized as a top fighter on a global level. Still, the fight would be expected to draw in between 50 to 60,000 fight fans. On January 14th, Ali was doing big things as he signed a contract for radio rights on his upcoming defense against Sonny Liston. A date for the upcoming bout with Liston had not yet been established. Ali had not received an answer from his physician and was told that he would receive an answer the following week. According to Ali, he felt good and was now ready to train. He continued his verbal attacks on Liston, saying that Liston likes the city to pay his bills and said Liston is a low-life criminal that cannot stay out of jail long enough for progression to take place in building towards the upcoming fight. Ali said he would be ready to fight Liston six weeks after receiving a nod from his physician. On January 15th, Patterson told the media that he believes he is better than he has ever been but will consider retirement if George Shavalo defeats him. One disadvantage Patterson had was that he had never seen Shavalo fight, but Patterson said that he has fought fighters that are aggressive and that he would be ready for Shavalo's forward movement. Patterson was still bothered by the losses to Sonny Liston and said that he wants a third fight with Liston. And that means even if Liston loses again to Ali. On the 15th, criticism was still being directed at the WBA for stripping Ali. Most of the criticism was coming from the New York and Massachusetts State Boxing Commissions. Now, 
The boxing magazines and hardcore fight fans, many of them did not care who Ali was affiliated with outside of the ring. Even some of the fight fans that did not support Ali to the fullest preferred to see Ali lose in the ring. They wanted a loss to rub in Ali's face. Fighters rated highly and the WBA all wanted to fight with Ali as Ali was where the money was at. Patterson went as far as to saying he was not interested in fighting the winner in the upcoming WBA title fight between Ernie Terrell and Eddie Machen. The media was also more interested in Ali than any other fighter in the world. There was no doubt about it that Ali was the cash cow. Daily updates was being released on Shavalo and Patterson's training. The biggest news for Ali on the 15th of January is that he had agreed to let his wife, who used to be a model, be interviewed for the first time but insisted that he be present during the interview. He admitted that he had to keep her away from the press until he could coach her, telling the media he didn't want his baby to say the wrong things. Before the interview, Ali reminded the media that this was not something that would be happening often, as Muslim women are to remain in the background and are not to seek any attention outside of marital obligations. She talked mostly about her new life and being Ali's wife. She spoke on what his favorite foods were and described him as a Prince Charming that had swept her off her feet. Ali and his wife participated in the interview at Ali's parents' home. Ali said that they had a 10 bedroom home being built in Chicago. At the time of the interview, they had been living in a lavish apartment in Chicago. She spoke on some of her expensive furniture, clothing and jewelry. It was also discovered that she had a previous marriage and a young son. Ali would not allow his wife to go into detail, but it appeared as though her son was not living with them. If Ali did not like the questions, he would answer the questions for her. She appeared to be submissive and only had to be interrupted by Ali a few times. She did admit that being Ali's wife was demanding. On January the 16th, Shavalo spoke on training and again said that he was going to knock Floyd Patterson out. His main trainer appeared to be Theodore McWhorter and Charlie Goldman was brought in to help Shavalo shorten up on his punches. On January 16th, Floyd Patterson continued to express his interest in a fight against Liston. One concern fight fans may have had was the question, is Patterson overlooking Shavalo for a third match with Liston or perhaps a match with Ali? Patterson had been talking about Liston more than any other fighter, including his next opponent, George Shavalo. Was Patterson still recovering mentally from the two losses he suffered to Liston? Patterson continued to say that he would perhaps retire if he lost to Shavalo and then said that he would be happy when in a decision. He said that Ali's nickname for Shavalo of Washerwoman was far from the truth and said that Shavalo has made some technical improvements even though he's never seen Shavalo fight. This was through word of mouth that Patterson was getting his information. January 16th. The WBA continues their campaign against Ali. Once again, in the year of 1965, the WBA was the sanctioning body with all the power. The Ring magazine was well respected and also had a lot of power. The WBA outlined their reasons for stripping Ali. One had to do with the signing for a rematch to take place with Sonny Liston. The WBA, which was recently the NBA, had never had problems with past championship rematches as Floyd Patterson was given two championship rematches in recent years. The other reason Ali was stripped was because the WBA didn't believe he was a good role model and his actions was inked as acts detrimental to boxing. The WBA had also removed Sonny Liston and Cleveland Williams from their rankings after both had recent run-ins with law enforcement officers. The writers of this time period inked that the main reason the WBA stripped Ali was because of Ali's affiliation with the Nation of Islam. Many of the media didn't like Ali's arrogance and thought that the best way that Ali could be humble was for Ali to get beat in the ring. The WBA stripping of Ali didn't do anything to silence the fighter that many fight fans love to hate. Many fight fans believe that Ali was the champion whether they liked him or not. 
The upcoming WBA title fight between Terrell and Machen was not generating much interest. The times that Ali fought in was still a time when race was a factor in all major sports. Race related articles was being displayed daily in newspapers around America. Ali was a standout athlete in an era of many greats. It wasn't long ago that a few color lines had been broken. Other than Sonny Liston, he was the highest paid athlete on a global level. And with 1965 just beginning, with a few more successful fights, Ali would be in a category of his own. Also on January 16th, there was more prestige added to George Chavalo's resume as he became Canada's fighter of the previous year. The more ink Chavalo received, the better it was for Chavalo as newspaper and magazine articles was still the most common way to receive exposure as a fighter. January 17th, two-time former heavyweight champion Floyd Patterson continues to receive ink mostly to build his upcoming fight against Canadian heavyweight George Chavalo. Patterson was a media darling. He was a nice friendly fighter with a clean record. He was not connected to controversy and he was also a humble fighter. The media of this time period appeared to like humble athletes. Ali also had a clean record but was connected to the black Muslims. The trash talk coming from Ali increased Ali's popularity. And like the old saying goes, controversy sells. But Patterson was also a media favorite and most of the articles coming from the media regarding Patterson was positive other than a few writers that would question Patterson's heart or criticize Patterson for the two losses he suffered in championship bouts facing Sonny Liston. For the most part, the media was still inking Ali Cassius Clay and their new nickname for Ali was Muhammad Hernia. Most of the articles coming out would ink him as Cassius Clay. But Patterson was a favorite for many of the media and he also spoke out against both Liston and Ali. Floyd Patterson also refused to call Ali by his name when speaking with the media. January 18th, 1965. A small boxing gathering would take place in New York. That would be the Boxing Writers Association annual dinner. It was at this dinner that the boxing riders would mix with the old school fighters and young fighters for a night of fun, entertainment, and boxing discussion. Muhammad Ali would show up at this event and finally get the opportunity to meet some of his critics, including legendary fighters such as Jack Dempsey and Mickey Walker. There was only 21 current and past champions present, but this would give Ali an opportunity to mix it up with Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney. Recently, Dempsey, Tunney and Mickey Walker was not happy with Ali as he told the media that he would have easily whooped Jack Dempsey if they met prime for prime. When Ali arrived, it was all smiles as Ali was respectful towards the past legends. They returned respect to Ali and all went well as Ali playfully interacted with Dempsey, Tunney and the other past champions in attendance. Ali did, however, find time to deliver a controversial speech. He told those in attendance that there's nothing wrong with boxing that a few more white hopes wouldn't cure. He looked at Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney and said if there were more white fighters like Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney and a fighter like me to fight them, they would draw $30 million gates. He was bold enough to tell the old school fighters that black fighters were dominating boxing. This must seem a little sad to white men, Ali added. I'm pulling for the washerwoman, George Chavalo, to defeat the rabbit, Floyd Patterson, Ali told the crowd. He went on to say that Chavalo is the fight that would sell better, concluding his speech by telling the crowd he's telling them what people say but are not brave enough to say out loud. His speech was followed up by a standing ovation. Dempsey and some of his buddies that gathered up at Dempsey's restaurant seemed to agree with Ali as they clapped. Ali would also win an award for the Ring Magazine Fight of the Year in 1964 for defeating and dethroning Sonny Liston. Also on January 18th, the media spoke with 54-year-old Tony Two-Ton Galento again, and he was still saying that Ali and Liston were overrated bums. He said that he was capable of coming back at age 54 and beating both fighters in the same night. Galento also thought that boxing was on the downslide and he had a few suggestions and ideas, one of those ideas being for fighters to start participating 
in tag team boxing matches. Now just recently we saw one of these matches discussed and perhaps unfolding with a Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather tag team match. But this is something that Tony Two Ton Galento discussed decades ago in the 1960s. So this vision had been brought to the table or brought forth before. Older fighters appear at times to be the hardest fight fans to impress while evaluating younger fighters. This has been going on for decades. And impressing the older fighters was no different in 1965 than it was in previous eras or even today. In 1965, there were older heavyweight fighters coming from anywhere between the Dempsey era and the Marciano era that would weigh in on fighters of the current time. Most of them did not appear to be impressed with the 1960s heavyweight scene. Ali had been going around saying that boxing needs more white hopes. This was not the first time Ali had said that. When Shavalo was asked about being a white hope, he told the media that he does not like being viewed as a white hope, but said that he could be honest about race and boxing, telling the media that fight fans like to see fights between white and black fighters. Shavalo said that he accepts it for what it is. He described himself as a family man with a wife and four boys. On the 19th of January, Eddie Machen continued to make his case for Azar in boxing. He said Azar is needed to decide who the heavyweight champion is and who the heavyweight champion should fight next, but many fight fans already had their minds made up. Ali was the lineal champion and a large percentage of fight fans preferred to see Ali lose his status in the ring. Machen was from the West Coast and was from the state of California. Machen had previously lived a life of crime that started in the 1940s. In the early 1950s, Machen was arrested and convicted of armed robbery. In 1962, he was admitted to a psychiatric institute. He did not fight until over a year later. Machen was said to be unstable and had a few rounds with mental health. He was said to be a nice guy that could go from 1 to 100 at the drop of a dime. But one strength Machen had was the ability to fight. He was a smart technical fighter and in 1965 he was still considered to be one of the top 5 heavyweights in the world. His upcoming fight with Ernie Terrell was for the WBA Heavyweight Championship of the World. Machen spoke to the media in San Francisco at a dinner held in his honor. He said that if he becomes champion, he would be a good champion and take on the best fighters in the world. Even though he had recently lost the decision, the former heavyweight champion of the world, Floyd Patterson, Machen believed that he would defeat Floyd in a rematch. In fact, Machen thought he could beat every fighter in the world, including Muhammad Ali. The highlight of January 19th was in the morning when Ali decided to take the wheel of his bus filled with media and would run the bus off a narrow mountain into a two foot snowy ditch. His intention was to gather up some media men and crash George Shavalo's training camp. It was supposed to be a surprise for Shavalo, but Shavalo would soon find out Ali was on his way. The crash happened a few hundred yards from the training site. Ali's excuse for crashing the bus was that he thought he had saw the washerwoman walking across the street. Ali, his team, and some reporters would walk the rest of the trip while the bus situation would get sorted out. Ali drifted behind the crowd, and this is a picture of Ali that was taken as he walked the snowy path to Shavalo's camp. So, here we are, right? Yeah, I'm gonna try to bust him. Yeah, I'm gonna try to bust him. When Ali walked in, Shavalo was warming up. Ali walked into the ring with a mop, pail, and wash clothes. Now let's not forget that Shavalo interrupted an Ali presser the previous year dressed as a washerwoman. This was a nickname Ali gave Shavalo because of Shavalo's wild, aggressive haymaker style. Ali spoke to Shavalo. I have come as the heavyweight champion of the world to offer you a chance at becoming champion which would bring you great honor and dignity and make you a national hero in your home state of Canada. If you can defeat the rabbit and look good in defeating him, someday you may be in a $10 million fight with me. Thanks a lot, Popeye, Shavalo replied. Popeye was another nickname Shavalo gave Ali. He said that he gave Ali the name Popeye because Ali didn't have big biceps. He had bigger forearms than he had biceps, so... This is a name that Shavalo came up with. Shavalo, of course, 
He was a real big muscular guy who had really big biceps. Ali didn't have extremely small biceps, he just didn't have the muscular body of Shivalo. As Ali handed Shivalo a mop in the pail, Shivalo took the mop in the pail and handed it to a team member and Ali stepped outside of the ring and said, now I will sit down and observe if you have a chance. Ali trash talked Shivalo throughout his whole workout, telling Shivalo that he was too flat footed and too slow. He would continuously call him a washwoman or washerwoman. Sometimes it was just washwoman. It didn't matter, Shivalo got the point. Ali would say things like, the big ugly bear son and listen would be both of you on the same night and I played with him. I am the greatest. I'm the king. I believe you holding back, George. You must be hiding your ability from me. At one point, Ali got up and said, let me in there, let me in that ring. He insulted me and I'm going to whoop him now. I'm going to whoop that washerwoman. For anyone that just happened to have checked in at the resort, they received an unexpected display of good old Southern trash talk. Some cheered. Some told Ali to shut his mouth and stop disturbing Shivalo's training session. Shivalo was not like some of Ali's other opponents. Shivalo knew how to talk some trash as well and after his sparring session would tell Ali things like, you're my biggest fan, calm down, I will give you my autograph. According to some of the articles, Shivalo did most of his own talking after the training session, but did briefly respond to Ali from time to time. As the sparring went on, Ali got louder and more animated. He was jumping out of his seat, threatening to get in the ring. He also put in some bag work to take some attention from Shivalo. After Shivalo was done, Ali had some gloves on and had climbed into the ring. He wanted at least one round with Shivalo. Shivalo jawed off with Ali for a few minutes. He told Ali not to bother him while he was training and then went back on to his locker room. As Shivalo walked off, an animated Ali told onlookers, See, he's afraid of me. The washerwoman is scared. Ali concluded by saying that Shivalo talked too much and he did not like fighters that tried to out-talk him. He then said that Shivalo was better than he thought and said that Shivalo was too strong to be called a washerwoman and from now on he will call him the washerman. Ali then told the media that Shivalo's upcoming opponent Floyd Patterson better be ready because he was going to be crashing Patterson's training camp next. Floyd Patterson was the former two-time heavyweight champion of the world. He was known to be a media friendly guy and also known to be soft spoken. Even though Ali was visiting the camps to self-promote a little of course, as one of the most popular and outspoken fighters, he was also helping to promote the upcoming fight between Floyd Patterson and George Shivalo. He was also hired to be one of the commentators. Ali was not Patterson's favorite fighter and if it was up to Patterson he would prefer Ali to stay away from his training camp. Patterson told the media that he was not worried about Ali and that he was not training to fight Ali, so Ali had no reason to show up at his training camp. Ali's name for Patterson was the rabbit. According to Ali, he called Patterson the rabbit because Patterson was afraid, and according to Ali, Patterson was afraid not only of certain fighters, but Patterson was also afraid to stand up to the system of white supremacy. Since Patterson knew Ali was coming, the question was, will Patterson have the patience with Ali that Shivalo had? There was also some news on one of Shivalo's sparring partners jumping ship and going to Team Patterson. There was some speculation that this sparring partner could have been a spy for Team Patterson the whole time. The 22nd came, and sure enough, Ali showed up to Patterson's camp. Patterson was waiting on Ali. Ali walked into the gym and gave Patterson some lettuce and carrots, followed by a speech telling Patterson that he would be given a chance to regain pride and prestige if he could defeat George Shivalo. Patterson smirked and took the lettuce and carrots. Ali started off mild asking Patterson, how do you think you are going to beat me? Patterson smiled at Ali and balled up his fists and pointed his fist at Ali. Patterson then climbed in the ring. When Patterson got in the ring, it's like a light switch was turned on in Ollie's head. Ollie started screaming insults at Floyd Patterson. Ollie then challenged him to a fight right there and then, and Patterson accepted. Ollie was held back. He then started to call Patterson names. A media man asked Patterson for a reaction to Ollie's wild behavior while Ollie was calling him names. Patterson responded by saying, Talk you can get anywhere. 
It's when you touch me that I get bothered. Despite the lettuce and the carrots, I'm very happy that Mr. Clay took the time to, at that point, after he said took the time to, Ollie cut Patterson off and asked Patterson, what did you call me? What did you call me, rabbit? My name is Muhammad Ali and you better call me that. You know my name ain't that. Call me by my real name, not my slave name. Patterson then looked at a media man and said, I'll call him by the name he was born with. Ollie stood behind the ropes and yelled, You are nothing but an Uncle Tom Negro. You're a white man's slave. I'm a free man. I'm nobody's slave. But you're a slave and a scared rabbit. You apologize or I'll come at you right now. I'll jump right in there on you now. Patterson looked at Ollie and said, Do it. And then Patterson stood in the center of the ring. Patterson again told Ollie to bring it on. According to some reports, Ollie again tried to get in the ring and Patterson exited the ring from the other side. According to other reports, Ollie did not attempt to get in the ring when he was asked by Patterson to come do it right this second. These spectators said that Patterson was led by his manager out of the ring. So there were some reports making it appear as though it was Patterson that was scared. There was other reports that made it appear as though it was Ali that was scared. Maybe neither one of them was scared. Regardless of how it happened, Ali had something to say when Patterson left the ring. Come back, you quitter. Come back, you rabbit. I knew you would be scared to work out. You done quit twice already, the son of Liston. Don't quit a third time. Come on back and go to work. I promise you I won't bother you. Patterson did come back but cut his sparring session short, only doing two rounds. Ollie was quiet as Patterson completed the two rounds, but when Ollie realized that Patterson was only going to spar two rounds, he loudly screamed out that the king is leaving. Ollie also had a rhyme. George the washerwoman will win no doubt because the rabbit has a habit of being knocked out. No matter who wins February 1st, I'll whip them both if worse come to worse. Ollie told the media, that he was not finished with Patterson and that he would be back tomorrow. He also said that Shivalo would stop Patterson in five rounds. With the Shivalo fight close, Team Patterson released an early statement telling Ali not to waste his time and that he was now banned from their training location. According to Patterson's manager, Ali ducked out of a fight when Floyd called his bluff by intensifying his theatrics. January 22nd, Germany. Boxing is of course a global sport and something we want to look at in this series is heavyweight boxing on a global level. The top heavyweight in Germany was a fighter named Carl Mildenberger. The WBA had Mildenberger rated at number 9 and most of the magazines had him rated at number 7. His biggest setback came in an EBU title shot when he was stopped by British heavyweight and EBU champion of that time, Dick Richardson, three years earlier. Since losing to Richardson, Mildenberger had 15 fights including draws with Amos Johnson and Zora Foley. On the night of January 22nd, he was fighting an American fighter named Jefferson Davis. Davis had won his last two fights but recently lost the decision to highly rated Ernie Terrell who was getting ready to fight for the WBA title. One advantage Mildenberger had was that he was a heavyweight southpaw. Davis had crossed the Atlantic one time earlier in his career when he traveled to the UK and stopped Henry Cooper's twin brother, Jim Cooper. Davis was originally from Texas, but was now fighting out of Vegas. Even though Davis had a few losses, he had never been stopped. So if Mildenberger could stop Davis, that accomplishment would make a statement. Mildenberger had never fought in America. His plan was to get a victory and then make his American debut. Mildenberger would win a unanimous decision. Davis came on strong in the last two rounds of the 10 round bout, but according to media reports, he waited too late to press the action and by round nine needed a knockout to win. On the 22nd, it was also announced that highly rated Zora Foley would fight exciting undefeated young knockout specialist Oscar Bonavina. Bonavina was a hard punching heavyweight from Argentina. Many fighters wanted no parts of Bonavina and the fear was coming through word of mouth. The fight was scheduled to take place at the end of February. To conclude heavyweight boxing news coming from the date of January 22nd, there was some breaking news. Henry Cooper would be out longer than expected after suffering a cut in his last victory. 
Henry Cooper was the biggest name in the heavyweight division coming from out of the UK. According to the news, he could be out until April. January 23rd, the WBA continues to release articles reminding the fight fans that they have stripped Ali of their title and that Terrell and Machen would be fighting for their vacant strap. At the same time, the WBA was receiving criticism for stripping Ali as many fight fans preferred to see Ali lose his championship in the ring. The WBA had also dropped Sonny Liston and Cleveland Williams for both fighters having recent run-ins with law enforcement. While the WBA was attempting to downplay Ali, Ali was receiving daily attention from the media and was also set to provide commentary for the upcoming Patterson vs. Shuvalo fight. Ali did complete a radio interview and expressed his issues with the WBA. According to Ali, he's the champion regardless of what anybody says. The only way he could lose his championship is for a fighter to defeat him in the ring. According to Ali, there was not a man on the planet that could defeat him in that ring. On January 23rd, Floyd Patterson was back to his regular training routine. Ali had been banned from the camp. Ali's original plan was to return to Patterson's camp as he had also challenged Patterson to a fight outside the ring. But Ali received the memo that he would not be allowed to enter the gym and decided not to come back. According to Floyd, Ali still taught him something about the sweet science and he gave Ali credit for exposing Liston as a quitter. In fact, Patterson said that he has decided to utilize more movement in future fights and that he has torn a page out of Ali's book of footwork and movement. Patterson said that he does have the ability to utilize more footwork in his fights but tends to get caught up mixing it up on the inside with his opponents. He said that he will be utilizing his superior hand speed and counter punching abilities added with a little bit more footwork. Floyd Patterson, he had a little bit of family business on his mind as his brother was fresh off of getting in a fight in a road rage incident. It appears as though Patterson's brother got the best of the highway brawl and Patterson was speaking to attorneys as he was ready to defend his brother. Floyd told the media that he was surprised to see so many of them after Ali left camp. Of course, Patterson still called Ali Clay. He told the media that he was more laid back than Ali and that he was not looking for any extra attention. However, he now had a new goal and that was to be the first three-time heavyweight champion. But the losses to Sonny Liston still seemed to bother Patterson and the media took notice. They would constantly bring up the losses and Patterson admitted that the losses still bothered him and that he had the wrong game plan going into the Liston fights. Patterson wanted to be the heavyweight champion of the world again but wanted a third fight with Liston as well. He said that his immediate goal was to defeat Shavalo and then get a fight with the winner between Ali and Liston. However, getting a third fight with Liston was something that he needed and if Patterson did not get a third fight with Liston, he felt as though his boxing career would be incomplete and that he would fall short of his accomplishments. Patterson had no interest in fighting the winner in the upcoming WBA title fight between Ernie Terrell and Eddie Machen. Over the next few days leading to the big fight between Patterson and Shavalo, the media took a few shots at Ali, inking that Ali's promotion is taken away from the seriousness of the big fight. Ali's promotion and visits to the fighters' camps was being referred to as the Cassius Clay Carnival. Some of the media felt as though Ali was receiving too much attention, especially considering he was not one of the fighters fighting in the upcoming bout. On January 25th, another offer was extended to popular Cleveland Browns running back Jim Brown to take a fight with the heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. A few offers had been made since Ali had won the title in 1964. But as of January 25th, the offer was now $2 million to lace up some gloves and fight Ali in a one-time fight. This would be like a football player being offered close to $19 million to fight the heavyweight champion in the year of 2023. Jim Brown answered the same day and said thanks, but he does not need the money and said that Ali would probably hurt him. Jim Brown said that he was a football player and not a boxer. Brown had also just recently signed a deal with Paramount Studios 
to complete three movies. So maybe Jim Brown may have found a new career as an actor to follow after he has concluded his football career. As of this time, the 28-year-old Jim Brown said that he only had two years left in football. One thing about George Chavallo in the year of 1965, Chavallo at times didn't appear to mind embracing the role of a white hope. According to Chavallo, it was a box office asset, but that's as far as Chavallo was willing to embrace the role. There was a series of articles that surfaced before the patterson Chavallo fight making reference to the color line. In the 1960s, boxing writers would make comparisons between modern day fighters and past fighters. The color line would still come up in heavyweight fights that involved a white and a black fighter, especially championship heavyweight fights. Patterson, Lewis, and Walcott, as well as a few other heavyweights, stayed away from race talk as much as they could, whereas the new heavyweight champ, Ali, would constantly bring up race and boxing discussions. Jack Johnson's name was still coming up often. According to some articles, the Joe Lewis era weakened a strong era of race discussions. But there was many white fans that wanted to revive the era of the white hope discussions. Joe Lewis did not take debate during his reign and shied away from race discussions as much as possible. Ali had revived the race discussions since winning the heavyweight crown and added strength and relevance to the discussions when appearing in front of Dempsey and Tunney at a dinner earlier in the month. Of course, Ali had said that boxing needs a white hope. Dempsey and Tunney smiled as Ali spoke and did not make any statements disagreeing with Ali. Instead, they appeared to have a great time mixing it up with the young heavyweight champion. There was another upcoming event going on in Canada in the next few days, and rumor had it Mickey Walker was in town and would be present. Walker had been angry with Ali and even said on multiple occasions that he would like to fight Ali himself. But Walker did not have much to say at the New York dinner as Ali was treated well by Dempsey and Tunney. Had Mickey Walker moved past the trash talk coming from Ali regarding Ali beating old legends in their primes? On January the 25th, there was more discussion in the air on heavyweight contender Karl Mildenberger. Mildenberger, who was from Germany, had never fought in America and was advised by some American boxing media to stay in Germany where he is popular. Mildenberger was drawing big crowds in Germany but was basically unknown in America. He was being advised to bring the American fighters to him in Germany. Would Mildenberger ever make his American debut? He wanted to fight with Ali and wanted to enhance his popularity in America. On the 26th of January, there was more news on Ali regarding his presence and promotion of the upcoming patterson Juvalo fight. Some people thought Ali was receiving too much attention and others said that Ali had livened up a boring buildup. One common interest shared by Patterson and Shavalo was to shut Ali's mouth. So no matter what side of the fence individuals in the media was on, both fighters wanted to fight Ali. The upcoming WBA title bout between Ernie Terrell and Eddie Machen did not appear to be generating much interest. Even though Patterson was the favorite on paper to beat Chavallo, Dempsey, Marciano, and Lewis were picking Chavallo for the victory in the upcoming bout. Chavallo appreciated the blessings, especially coming from his childhood idol Joe Lewis. On the 28th of January, a selection of boxing gloves was presented to both camps. Both Patterson and Chavallo tried on and picked their gloves for the upcoming fight. Patterson continued to speak on another fight with Liston. He said that if Liston gets defeated by Ali, he could gain vindication through defeating Ali. If he does become champion though, he would want an immediate defense against Sonny Liston. Patterson told the media that Liston had been arrested over 20 times, mostly due to aggressive behavior towards law enforcement officers. Patterson then asked the media how the big bad inmate ended up quitting. He no longer appeared to have the so-called fear of Liston some media felt he had in the past. Patterson appeared to be consumed with Ollie and Liston. Was he overlooking George Chavallo? Patterson was said to be a multi-millionaire. He said that he continues to fight because he wanted revenge and also wanted to be champion of the world again. He assured the media that he was financially set for life but was far from ready to hang up the gloves. 
On the 28th, former heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Dempsey, continued to campaign hard for George Chavalo. He said that he believes Chavalo is going to knock out Patterson, Liston, and Ali. He said that boxing needs George Chavalo. Dempsey did not like the way the boxing environment looked in the 1960s and viewed Chavalo as some kind of savior. On the night of January 28th, there were celebrities at this big dinner in Canada. Present was heavyweight champion of the world, Muhammad Ali. Ali was even surrounded for autographs by other celebrities. Over 1,200 people showed up to the dinner, and according to the media, many of them was there to see Ali. Ali told the people that Shivalo would knock out Patterson and that he would be champion of the world until he is defeated in the ring. He also down-talked the WBA son. Ali was having a good time, and when Ali saw Mickey Walker, who was in town, he took some special time out to mix it up with the legend. Ali paid a great deal of respect to the 1920s legendary fighter, and the outspoken Walker, who had been critical towards Ali at Dempsey's restaurant, returned the respect. January 30th, 1965. Well... While Ali was in Canada participating in celebrity dinners and helping promote the upcoming bout between Patterson and Shivalo, which was getting ready to take place in New York, Ali appeared on the negative side of the press on the 30th as his Muslim brother and former employee Leon Amir's name surfaced again. In episode 5, we spoke on a former direct employee of Ali being beaten by his Muslim brothers. That would be Leon Amir. Since leaving the Nation of Islam, Leon Amir had joined up with Malcolm X, who was also no longer with the NOI. Interactions between Malcolm X and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had been heating up to high temperatures. On the 30th, Leon Amir had to be rushed to the hospital with a major concussion. Now, Amir had recently been badly beaten by a group of his Muslim brothers, and he was now being placed on what the media called the danger list. He was supposed to testify against four Muslim men in the next coming days and it appeared as though there may have been some foul play. Ali's name was constantly being connected to this story. As of now, Amir appeared to be in stable condition, but there was no doubt about it, there was a target on Amir's back. The day before the big bout between Patterson and Shivalo, the legends gave their final predictions. Ali's manager and trainer Angelo Dundee picked Shivalo, and so did Dempsey, Marciano, and Joe Lewis. James J. Braddock was picking Patterson to win. Legendary trainer and former Floyd Patterson trainer and manager Custom Motto had not spoke to Patterson since Patterson was stopped by Sonny Liston in their second bout. According to Cuss, it was Floyd who has a chip on his shoulder and no longer wants to talk to him. Cuss said that he had reached out to Floyd several times but cannot get through to him. However, he believes Floyd would beat Shuvalo. According to Cuss, it depends on how much Floyd Patterson has left. Cuss still went with his heart and decided that he is going with Floyd Patterson to defeat George Shuvalo. Sonny Liston was also back in court for his fourth traffic ticket in the past few months and also on charges of the recent running he had with law enforcement. Liston admitted to belligerent acts but said that his treatment by law enforcement officers would have made a preacher belligerent. Liston was found innocent regarding the drunk driving charges but according to some reports Liston would still have his driver's license suspended. He briefly talked to the media after court and said that he was going to open up training camp for the rematch against Muhammad Ali. In the next episode, we will cover the Patterson vs. Shuvalo fight along with other heavyweight boxing news and fights coming from out of the year of 1965.